Hello and welcome everyone. Well, welcome to our very first episode of Publisher Profiles and today we're going to be looking at a very special site but I wanted to welcome a guest today into helping me break down our publisher uh, for this episode and that is Ron Stefanski, the one hour professor. Ron, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining and thanks for being a part of this uh, this little experiment. Yeah, Tyler, thanks so much for having me and I'm uh, honored to be the first, the first guest on the first one. That's pretty awesome. So yeah, I'm excited. So before we go any further, maybe you can give everyone just a quick kind of uh, rundown if people aren't familiar with you or um, your online persona of the one hour professor. You are an actual professor as well um, and have been one for, for many years. And so maybe you could fill everyone in uh, a little bit on your background. Yeah. Uh, so basically I worked in corporate America doing, uh, I became a digital marketing manager, did that for about 10 years, left that to um, kind of work on my own thing, uh, which was the one hour professor.com website. Uh, started that pretty much didn't do so well in the beginning, started to build out a uh, website portfolio, ended up uh, getting to about what I think nine different websites, have sold a few, still have a few. Uh, so I basically do that mostly full time. And then, yeah, I still teach part time at a few different colleges, mostly digital marketing and, and business in general. And, you know, if you want to learn more, one hour professor dot com, that's the easiest way to, to learn more about me. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, you, you're you're a bit of a renaissance man, and I think that that, that is uh, a really great trait to have because I think one of the trends that we're seeing right now is the rise of independent publishers, and you know the ability for even people that are content creators or uh, these kind of brands that that are existing inside of these larger media conglomerates, you know, actually making the effort to to go independent and to move away from you know this kind of like larger entity. Um, so you'll have, you know, YouTubers or uh, journalists and stuff like that breaking away and kind of doing their own thing. And um, I think that that makes today's kind of profile a little bit more interesting because um, there's someone that I think kind of lives a little bit in that in between. And today we're going to be talking about Thrillist. And so um, I know that this was the one that uh, I teed up to a little bit when we were discussing, you know, potential profiles this week. And um, yeah, I know that you did a little bit of background research on Thrillist heading into this. And I was just curious, you know, of the things that you read initially, what, what stuff popped out to you that was unique or interesting about uh, this particular publisher? Um, Thrillist in general. So I, I, I mean, because I think most people have probably heard of Thrillist by now. Um, and usually I heard of them, you know, when you talk about Thrillist, I'm finding out I, I'm not on their email list, uh, which is a huge asset that they have. Um, but I'm not on their email list. What I am is I'm an individual that would see the stuff basically shared on Facebook, on social media, right? Um, so that's kind of how I had known Thrillist in general. But going into the history of the company and the mistakes and, <laughs> and learning opportunities and things that they've done, I thought it was pretty interesting um, because they really, they started out as a, you know, just a media publisher, like, you know, like one of my own sites, like one of the ones I have um, in New York. And they started out there just kind of talking about New York and like travel guides and city guides and that sort of thing. Uh, and then they had basically slowly gone to different cities and grown. They had then gone to the point to where they bought, um, they had purchased Jack Threads, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if I've never heard of that brand before personally, but apparently it was a pretty big e-commerce brand. Uh, and then, you know, they merged into a larger media conglomerate. They ended up uh, basically selling off the Jack brands, um, the whole platform, which is also interesting to me because it seems like that didn't go so well <laughs> uh, with, with that. And then they also um, had two different sites that they had started, uh, which I thought, well, we can talk about things that they've done and not done well, but uh, they had two different sites that they had started uh, also in that whole interim with uh, the Crosby Press was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the name of the other one, but I'm pretty sure there was one more that they had started as well as separate sites. Oh, it was called Super Compressor. It was like a tech site. Um, and I thought that was interesting that they had kind of, uh, instead of focusing on where they were, they deviated and tried these other things. So they were kind of looking to become, it seems like, a publisher of multiple sites, multiple, uh, you know, for, for the same audience. It's like the, the trend that I noticed. 
Um, but yeah, they have definitely a very interesting background and a story background. They've been around for quite some time as well, um, which, you know, you know, basically what they were started in 2004 from what I'm seeing. So yeah. I thought that their background was really interesting The history. I didn't know how big of a, how big of a newsletter they were. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. They were massive, massive. So I, yeah, just in general, I think they have a really interesting history as, as a company and they've, I think it shows even with a big company like that, they have failed and pivoted and failed and pivoted. And I, I like that. I like to see that because it shows that like, it's not just like linear straight line, you know, like you, you're zigzagging like crazy in order to succeed. And they're no, they're no different. So, yeah. And I think that that's the agility that you get. Uh, it usually is an independent publisher and you lose a little bit as you, um, as you get larger and larger. I mean, organizations naturally will get more uh, kind of bureaucratic as you grow and, you know, publishing really lends itself to that that agility you were referring to, and they're they're currently owned by what's what's called Group Nine Media, which they have a number of different brands. So uh, everyone from the Dodo uh, to Pop Sugar, some people might be familiar with, with which I think of Pop Sugar is kind of like a modern day, almost like a you know like a big version of an affiliate site. Uh, they make a lot of money yeah. from affiliates and direct product sales and things along those lines. Um, but what I found really interesting about Thrillist is, you know, they they claim that they're the number one lifestyle destination for quote unquote affluent millennials. It's a com score, you know, kind of category. Um, same thing kind of in, in Nielsen when it comes to, um, you know, they, they claim they're the number one content publisher in terms of digital reach. Um, and then, you know, 30 million plus uh, monthly unique visitors, 2 million plus uh, daily through, through email. So you mentioned the newsletter. Um, it's pretty impressive just from the standpoint of, you know, they're in a lot of different categories. The demographic they have is, is, is a valuable one typically for, for advertisers and for product sales in general, retail. Um, and then, yeah, the, the ability to be able to go out and, um, and, and be able to uh, do so many different categories, both travel and food, both extremely popular, and due to those well, I think is is cool. And one of the things that uh, I really picked out that I found interesting about them was, you know, they they have a really close tie to a lot of uh, restaurants and things like that in, in different cities because partially they are, you know, I, I know I find most of their content when I'm looking for like the best pizza in San Diego or something like that. And um, it's one of the unique things about the strategy to me is that they've done such a good job of kind of um, blending together, you know, uh, a direct connection to the audience via newsletter and then also being able to go out and get that organic traffic with, you know, kind of common stuff like where is the best place to get pizza in San Diego. So I'm interested with your background, you know, really understanding how to go out and get organic traffic and and things like that um is there anything that stuck stands out to you in terms of their strategy or just kind of their approach to you know uh organic traffic and just you know being found in search results yeah um so that was actually really interesting just kind of digging into um i looked at their in ahrefs i looked at their uh, account and yeah, they're bringing in quite a bit of traffic. Uh, and like, for instance, 2020 memes, they're number one on the whole internet. Uh, so it's its interesting what they've done. I think to me, they've they have started to rank for, um, like they ranked for best frozen pizza. They're number one for best frozen pizza. So that's not necessarily local. That's a huge, huge keyword term. And, and like 2020 memes, they're, they're ranking for some big ones, which happens when you're a big brand. But I think the thing that really stuck out to me with what they've done and how they've done it, uh, that was really interesting to me is the fact that, um, and I've talked about this actually quite a few times to some of the people that have like taught and that sort of thing, is that when you create content, it's always a good idea if you can somehow to spin it in a way to where it's localized. Um, because I really feel like Google, just generally speaking, likes to uh, showcase localized results uh, whenever possible to you know the searcher because you know just generally speaking it's a lot easier you know if you search a pizza restaurant and you're located in Chicago you don't want to see pizza restaurants in New York and all these different places you want to see it in Chicago and it seems to me that what they've really done is and they started in New York this way obviously is that they did that and I don't know how much in the beginning was organic traffic. Um, I can't really say, you know, speak to that. But I know in the beginning, 
they were building an email list uh, newsletter inside of New York. And then they were always giving hyper-targeted information about New York, right? Which is obviously a massive, massive market. So I think the fact, to me, their strategy, the biggest thing is probably how they focus on the localized content. And then they, it's, it's really not all that crazy. They basically did it in New York and then they said, oh, okay, it worked in New York. Now let's go to San Francisco. Let's go to Chicago. Let's go to all these different cities. And they've started to create localized content there. Um, and it's like, you look at it, it's like kind of a no brainer. It's like, well, yeah, of course that would work because it's localized. Um, the thing that did surprise me, well, not a, not a huge surprise, but like I am a little bit surprised as to how well they rank um, in some of the stuff just in general, like, like 2020 memes and like all that, because they're really focused on this localized content. So some of the things that they, they rank for, which is like top tier, I was kind of surprised by that because their content is built locally, not really generalized on purpose, you know? Uh, so that was one thing that I found really interesting with them and their strategy that obviously has worked pretty well. And they just built that ecosystem in New York and then said, hey, we have a hub here, let's go to this city and build a hub here. And obviously it's working. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because they've been able to um, use three different kind of like a three-pronged approach to um, basically garnering and also like maintaining a connection to their audience. You know, you mentioned kind of like getting into, um, you know, let's say the niche of like the travel food scene in New York uh, or Chicago and then being able to like um, basically uh, capture adjacent categories using a similar strategy. So rather than trying to figure out like how do we – rank number one in all these cities for, you know, the best pizza, like let's focus on like a big market where there's some value and then let's apply what we learn there and the stuff that's most effective so that we can accelerate our progress in some of these other categories. And I really like that they're using, you know, a mix of both ad funding, affiliate, you know, revenue models and things like that. Um, even some subscription uh, mixed in there. You mentioned before, um, you know, kind of the the localized approach and things like that, you know, it reminds me a little bit of The Athletic. You know, The Athletic launched with a, a decent amount of investment, uh, to say the least. They were poaching up a lot of local journalists and things like that uh, in the sports category. But they are purely subscription, and they sort of took a similar approach where they, they go into certain markets, uh, they try to do really great sports team coverage, um, but it's a, it's a little bit of a self-limiting model. And I think it starts by the fact that, you know, this is a company that started with a lot of cash in the coffers and traditionally, um, you know, in media, when you invest a ton of money up front, I mean, something like Quibi comes to mind here recently, which is a huge failure, um, where when you start with that huge investment up front, you have zero validation of whether or not something is going to, going to work or not. And you mentioned kind of the history of this one. You know, they've done a really good job of that. One of the things that I think uh, I'm interested in right now, and we'll see how it works for them, is they've got a lot of uh, unique content shows and creators that they're sort of um, marketing now. And, um, you know, that's a completely different strategy. You know, th this is, you, you, you think about best pizza in Chicago, that's informational content, you know having shows where you have a guy that goes around and has the best tacos in a certain area or something like that, you know, that's entertainment content. It's very different in terms of acquiring an audience and things like that. So I'm just kind of curious on, uh, from your perspective, you know, just kind of looking at this, um, you know, do you, how difficult do you think that it is to build like a following on, you know, entertainment content versus, you know, getting people to come to you for informational content? You're asking the right guy because I really focused on YouTube this year. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it's still informational content for me. It's not so much entertainment based, um, but it is definitely 1000% a different game. Uh, you're talking about a different game there completely. I personally think it's very difficult. The thing that they have working for them is because they're part of the, um, you know, that the larger company in general is that the group nine media they're able to probably leverage some learnings i'm sure like like now this i know is mostly you know video content so my guess is is that they're leveraging those different brands and the learnings from those different brands and scaling these other brands right so they're learning they're using what they learned in now this and now they're scaling thrillist with entertainment-based content 
Um, and now this isn't, you know, it's, it's kind of factual content, but it's, I guess you could kind of call it uh, entertainment based. So I think it's an interesting strategy. I think it's definitely different, but um, the thing that, the thing with Thrillist that I think is most interesting looking at their site, I can't tell you what, like how they make their most, the most of their money. I can't tell you that because it looks like their revenue sources are so, so, so diversified across so many different things. Um, and now they're, you know, focusing on this as well, you know? So that's kind of the whole thing is that the revenue is diversified so much that you have to wonder where is most of the revenue coming from? And also, you know, I, I'm sure right now that's a huge investment for them, all those different, cause that's not, especially if you're doing like high, high quality, which I haven't watched those shows, but I'm sure they are, that's a big investment. Uh, but they probably see it as, hey, well, let's create, you know, kind of like what Netflix did, hey, let's create original programming. That's how we're really gonna stick around because even if 10 of, you know, nine of these shows don't do well, we have one show that does incredibly well, that'll carry us and be a huge, huge revenue driver for the company. And when you have that big media conglomerate as a whole, there's just so much that you can learn. And it it's just how it works. Like even for a small publisher like, like myself, it's so, you learn so much as you fail, as you make mistakes, you learn so much that you can carry those learnings over. And you, you just mentioned it a minute ago, you carry those learnings over to other platforms and other things that you do. So that like now my hit rate when I started to site is much, much higher than it was in the beginning. Because now it's like, okay, let me do this, do my keyword research, I do it. And then I'm like, yeah, I, okay, this will work. And I just kind of know, hey, don't stop. And I'll just kind of focus on it, you know? So I think, I think it's definitely gonna be a challenge for them, but my guess is that they've got some insider knowledge <laughs> uh, that's going to really help them with that. And obviously they've got a massive platform, uh, to, which is, you know, the biggest thing is once you have that massive platform to start building that stuff up, it gets bigger and bigger. So, yeah. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting about it, um, you know, just kind of glancing through things and, and being able to kind of uh, break this down with you is, you know, the ability to kind of go in and perfect your, um, I guess your core competency, let's, you know, let's say it's being able to get that kind of travel, food, you know, demographic in a in a certain, uh, you know, hyper specific geographical niche. Now, there's all kinds of different ways you can slice up a category or a niche uh, of certain topics and subjects. Um, but being able to hyper target towards one and kind of find success so that you can expand out into adjacent ones, I think, is really smart. But once you build that audience, build that platform, you know, you mentioned it, it is a bit of an investment if you're going to, you know, uh, throw a bunch of cash at, uh, you know, creating original shows and, and, and things like that. It becomes something that, you know, you don't it's not the same thing where people are necessarily looking for. You know, I'm looking at one of their shows, Send Foods with Tim and David. You know, you're not necessarily, you know, looking for that right off the bat now. Once you have an audience, you can say, hey, I think my audience is really going to like this this particular type of video content or something like that. And and then all of a sudden, if you can actually build, you know, that form of entertainment content, now you actually have a greater connection to your audience. So, you know, our good friend Google, if they come along and they decide, you know what, we don't really like the type of content that you've built in these categories and maybe your organic traffic takes a hit, at least now you've built this like really valuable, um, uh, you know, content that people seek out. And, you know, the third prong of that that I really, really like is their, is their newsletter, you know? So, you know, all things aside, even if people aren't made, you know, in love with the shows that you have now, maybe they'll be in love with some of the future ones. And if not, you know, at least we know that you've got your core content that, hopefully people enjoy and and like and that you can subscribe to their newsletter and we know that they've been successful that being able to go out and really drive an audience uh, back to your site that way I think is really really cool and then it just becomes a um, uh, you know that that process of managing yield and the ROI you mentioned you know creating informational content and hiring you know writers you know maybe not as expensive is you know investing in that that entertainment content or show creators and stuff like that we were talking about earlier, you know, creators can almost start building content for someone like Thrillist. And if they get big enough, they might say, Hey, I'm going to be independent myself. And it is because there is a lot of value. If you can build that Netflix is a great example, I think of somebody that attracted a big audience with, you know, uh, 
uh, licensed content or um, you know syndication I think is what they call it in, in that space and um, you know being able to have that that drives an audience and saying hey we've got some original stuff here we think you'll like that especially once you have the data on it hey I've got a lot of 33 to you know 38 year olds they're really interested in gaming um, so maybe I can create a gaming show or something like that it yeah. really allowed you to kind of start one way and then start funding these you know like larger higher ceiling projects long term what do you think yeah no i, I agree and, and one of the biggest things i had i had to check just because i wasn't 100 percent sure as you were showing it so the send foods for example um, not surprisingly it, it is on youtube i wasn't 100 percent sure if that was just for thrillist uh so it is on youtube so i actually am doing this personally with my own portfolio to where we have a site and i'm cre creating a uh a, a uh, YouTube channel that is complementary to that site. And I think I think it's a really smart move. There is definitely an investment there. It's tough to do, but I understand the reasoning for it is pretty simple, is that now you're diversified from more like, okay, we've got, you know, we've got Google, Thrillist is obviously doing well on Google. Now let's move over to YouTube. And they're moving into all these niches that are probably pretty lucrative, I would imagine um in general and they're moving into these and they're creating this entertainment based content but it all rolls up into the larger thrillist umbrella right so they're diversifying their revenue they're diversifying their traffic sources they're diversifying their reach as a whole and that's really what i think has made them so big in general right like they've just been from from the experience from every or from everything i was researching that's what they've always been about is diversifying you know they, they started out in new york went to other cities they got that and then they got big in all those different areas. I'm sure their newsletters were spread out across all those areas. And then they said, hey, let's start creating content on YouTube too. Let's do video content because, you know, everyone talks about, hey, video is the future, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm a believer in that. That video is going to get bigger and bigger. So I totally understand what they're doing. I think it's a really smart move because it just diversifies the business more, diversifies the revenue more. Because if for, for whatever reason, Google has some vendetta against Thrillist in the future, right? And they decide, you know what? Thrillist did, like, let's say they did this thing that they should have done or whatever. They come after them and they knock down their website. Well, that's kind of okay because they still have all their newsletters. So they're diversified that way. Now they also have all their YouTube channels, everything that they're associated with. So, like, they have such an ecosystem at this point. It would be really hard <laughs> to get rid of uh, Thrillist at this point. They just have their hands in so many things. And I think, like, for beginners, like, because I, I, I always, I talk about this stuff and the beginners are like, yeah, I should do all that. It's like, no, just focus on like one thing at a time and grow that first. Um, but yeah, Thrillist, I think it's just interesting because they started with the content and it, it seems like that's really what they focused on and they did it, they did it really well. And then they took that gamble into other areas. And I don't know how much we're going to touch on this, but like the Jack threads when they were doing e-commerce, I thought that was like a really interesting part of the company um, that, you know, just through research I found. So. Yeah, and that's one of the, the, the trends, and I think, you know, as an independent publisher, um, I think if you're a, you know, site that's creating informational content or something like that now, driving most of the traffic to your site, earning money from, you know, uh, even something like Amazon affiliates or earning money from ads, um, you know, there's this model where if you can, can continue to expand and, and grow that, you can look at basically acquisitions and this is something we're seeing more and more common especially with the rise of e-commerce currently inside of the pandemic and things like that where if you're a site and all of a sudden you've been expanding you could target you know maybe a small e-commerce retailer or a small brand and say look i'm selling tons of kitty cat backpacks on my my website or something like that uh through an affiliate maybe i could acquire the the you know this brand that happens to make them or make some kind of backpack I can cut out a middleman here and now I own a brand. So I'm, I'm hedging a little bit here uh, and diversifying where I'm getting my online revenue from. But there's a syner natural synergy between the businesses. And I think the same thing works in terms of entertainment content. If you say, look, there's a really big overlap between um, the content that we create and also like, um, you know, maybe a YouTuber, Eat Seeker or something like that that lives out there. You could go and then say, hey, we're going to make a deal with this this YouTuber or we're going to acquire, you know, the majority of their, you know, their publishing business. We're going to bring their content onto our platform. They can continue to publish to YouTube and keep that revenue. But 
video content in particular, if you have your own hosted video player, the competition from advertisers for that ad inventory is so much higher than it is on YouTube because in YouTube, you're in a uh, closed ecosystem. You know, um, On YouTube, the ads that you see are sent through Google, it's through Google's ad exchange, but you know, you're basically gonna get paid whatever Google is able to sell in terms of advertisers uh, on their platform. On your own, you have a lot more flexibility there. Uh, you can choose to show pre-roll or mid-roll and things like that. Um, so I think that kind of flexibility, you know, provides value in terms of you know the publisher that may be acquiring the YouTuber and then the YouTuber themselves who may not have the the wherewithal to to, to grow their revenue or even grow their audience that way. So there's a lot of you know a, lit, a lot a litany of interesting opportunities there. I'd say. Uh, in in both respects in in that so I, I mean I know um, you mentioned thinking video is the future and I'm a big proponent of publishers bringing you know video in house and being able to to display it on their own um, I'm curious wh where do you think you know these trends extrapolate out to so let's let's say it's three four years in the future where does somebody like Thrillist go from here and is this a strategy they can you know maintain over that period of time. Um, I mean, generally speaking, I think Thrillist, uh, I, they have some interesting failures in the past, but I don't think this is going to be one of them, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I think that they'll continue to push the content just as they, as they have been. I think they may actually diversify. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they diversified a little bit more into video, um, because at this point, you know, you can only write so many guides of the best pizza places in Chicago. Right. You can only do that so many times. So I'm starting to wonder if they're kind of thinking, you know what, instead of just, you know, writing it for Google, let's also do it on YouTube. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if they actually pushed a little bit harder, because my guess is that they've got the, you know, they've, I'm sure their content team and the content game that they have uh, internally is really, really, really like high level. Uh, and I'm sure that they have, you know, with the writing content sort of thing. So I would think that they would probably start to do even more video possibly uh, and just diversify a little bit further. And then, I mean, I don't know that they'd ever like go into their own platform, so to speak, you know, uh, and like like their own version of Netflix. I don't know how easy it would be to do that, but at least I, I would think that they would definitely diversify uh, multiple channels on YouTube with multiple creators, kind of like what they've already been doing um, and just do more of the same to continue to grow uh, because I just don't see them with the content that they're doing and they publish so much content already and i know how that works eventually you hit a point to where it's like okay i've really published like what else can i publish you know but they're obviously talking about cities and they're talking about traveling and food so they have a ton of different content they, they can create but i do feel like there's there's a a point that you hit to where it's like hey we need to find ways to do other things so i think video will be big i also think um like and I don't know how much presence they have necessarily like on social media and all the ads, but that or the ads that they run and stuff. But I know that they're diversifying very heavily there as well, um, because that's like I said, that's how I found out about them was because, you know, here's the, the list of the top 10 pizza places in Chicago. You want to start some drama in Chicago. You make that list. That is that is like pure drama. Like you have people on the one side, they're like, yeah, absolutely, this was there. Then you have people on the other side, like, how dare you? You know. So there's some really big pizza aficionados out here, right? So like, I think that's a really big thing too, is that they do the social media, um, and I don't know how much of that contributes to their business. But I personally, when when you said they were going to be reviewing them, I actually thought they probably get more traffic, in my opinion, I was thinking, they probably get more traffic in social media, from social media than they do organic. That was what I thought. Then looking at their numbers, I was like, well, maybe not, but maybe. I, I actually really don't know for sure, um, but it seems like that could be you know, reasonable because they have all that local hyper, hyper, hyper content, hyperized local content, sorry. They have all that. So my thinking is, is that a lot of their content that they post on social ends up going viral. Right. And it drives a ton of traffic. So, yeah, like future state, I would say probably focusing, just continue to focus on uh, the content that they've created. They've got that kind of on lockdown and then focusing more on expanding into social other areas and also focusing on the video. I think I think future state will probably be their biggest thing. And then maybe diving back into e-commerce. I don't know. for <laughs> I don't know for sure, because the thing that you just mentioned. So, Tyler, you just mentioned something that's really important that I think everyone should if you're going to take away anything from this. So when you have a website 
and you are able to, like, let's say you have an Amazon affiliate website, super common. If you have that and you're able to drive a ton of leads to the, I think you said kitty backpack or something, which <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't have one personally, you know, uh, but yeah. So let's say in that example, right? Um, that's perfect. So the thing that they had mentioned was that because they had jack threads previously, they said you had to be really careful when you're recommending your own products, right? That was like the biggest thing. And then they later sold off that part of the company. I don't know why that is, but I thought that was a really interesting thing because they had built that. And when you do that, when you have a site, an Amazon site, and you're sending a bunch of traffic to Amazon, and then you get into maybe Shopify or you buy an e-commerce brand and you start pushing it, there is so much more money there. you know. And now you're really diversified. There's so much money there uh, that can that's for the taking if you can make people actually convert. Um, but I'm really curious. I, I would love to know more. I don't think that you can find it. I would love to know more about why Jack Threads was sold off. And then, you know, they kind of dropped the ball at the end when they did sell it. So I think that's a really interesting model that they could probably dive further into, but maybe based on something they learned with Jack Threads, they decided we're not going to do that. I don't really know. You know, that's like the, the unwritten part that you can't really find out there that I was looking for. So. Yeah, I, th I find it very interesting um, because I, I think you're right. I think that there's there's probably value in being able to um, you know cut out that middleman and um, be able to play that kind of like um, that process of finding you know the affiliate offer that is perfect for your audience and then being able to go out and specifically source that product or find a brand that you know like you could acquire or something along those lines. Um, the the what I've heard in the past, though, is that that is a um, that is a thirsty game to be in. Meaning, um, it it always is requiring you to keep that process going because it's very easy to start to fall behind. You know, whatever it is that you know, kitty cat backpacks or whatever it is, you know, they go out of fashion or they go out of style or they just you know the, that that audience has moved on to a new trend. And so there is an inherent risk there. And so the kind of I think the strategy they have now is a is a really good one. The I'm gonna put my marketer hat on and my my kind of future publishing hat on, and I'll say the thing that I think would be really cool that they could probably uh, move towards here, and where I see maybe a trend is the ability to go in and have um, uh, create more niche communities um, that's a little bit more exclusive and tap into user generated content, which is something that. They haven't so far. It's kind of in the opposite direction, right? Like going out yeah. to YouTubers. But if you think about where they're at right now, people come and get, you know, the best pizza places. You say, it, like, it gets, I mean, I, I have a lot of opinions about best pizza places yeah. in all the places that I've lived, right? And um, I think one of the things that could be really interesting uh, for them is to be able to take, um, you know, specific users or even power users or something like that and allow them to then start, you know, reviewing places and things like that uh, in their, you know, local spots and things along those lines. And maybe the, the longer that somebody follows or interacts or, you know, something along those lines, they, they have the ability then to become a contributor as well. And I think then you start getting, you know, content for free. And I think if there's one thing that we can learn from Google, Facebook, um, you know, a lot of these major platforms, Instagram, um, they've all found ways to get really smart, creative people to give them content for free. And so yep. I think if you really want to build a platform, one of the best ways to do it is that. And so um, that's my little uh, tip for, for them in the future. And who knows, they may be thinking about that already. But you can only spread yourself so thin, I suppose. So um, Yeah, and, and I, think, I think, too, uh, that was kind of one of the thoughts that popped into my head, right? It's like you could – I mean, they essentially could become a, a – version if you will of yelp right like not the exact same business model by any means but more community focused um the thing that i wonder because they're very editorial focused you know it's like here's here's the 10 best places in chicago for for pizza but you don't really know the why right behind that it could be that and i don't know for sure i don't know any of the people at throw so i'm not accusing but it could be hey this particular restaurant paid for the listing near the top or whatever that could be a thing at this point, maybe not with Thrillist, you know, they're so large, but I know smaller, I've seen smaller uh, blogs do sort of, so those sort of things. So like, you don't really know the motivations behind it or why they actually say, hey, these are the best. Now, if you were to get into the instance that Tyler is talking about, what I would 
completely agree with of the idea of, hey, la- now we've got this community in this in this local area. Let's really lean on our contributors and our community as a whole to find out what is really the best one, right? And to get that information, um, they definitely could dive further into there. And maybe, I don't know, maybe for some reason they don't wanna do that. I don't know what, the only thing I can think is like, you know, they don't wanna have maybe people saying bad things about a particular restaurant and then be held liable for it. You know, that's kind of the thing because you're gonna get, you're gonna get the positives and the negatives. When you rely on users, you're gonna get some really negative stuff but also some really positive stuff. So they, maybe they're worried about that really negative stuff from users getting them in trouble. But I think the uh, benefit of a community definitely could outweigh that uh, risk, in my opinion. So, Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, you know, I think you mentioned the editorial content. You know, There's no comment section or anything like that at the end of their articles. And so you know, it may be strategic. I mean, those things also present risks. Yeah. Uh, along the way, but very interesting and, and certainly something uh, I'll, I'll monitor. I'll definitely look at Thrillist differently uh, now moving forward every time I land on one of their pages um, than I did before. And um, I have no doubt that those that are listening to this um, will probably feel the same way. So, Ron, I want to thank you for joining me. This was uh, this is fun. And, um, yeah, we talked before this. This actually came from an inspiration of an exercise that I do a lot of times with, with marketing professionals um, internally. And uh, yeah, hopefully all the publishers that watched and listened along with us uh, had a chance to pick up a couple things. And uh, yeah, uh, any any parting notes to anyone listening? Um, where can they find you? Uh, you mentioned your YouTube channel a little bit earlier. Yeah, uh, if you're looking for me, you could just go onehourprofessor.com, the website, uh, YouTube. If, if, you, if you search one hour professor spelled out, you'll find me. Um, but no, other than that, I mean, I just think, I think that everyone needs to understand if you're still, if you have like one or two sites, you know, you're not really big yet. Don't be discouraged by this. Find it as an encouraging thing, something interesting to learn from or thrillist and realize that, you know, you can even do this. I mean, I feel like I'm doing a lot of what they're doing at a much smaller scale, right? You don't have to be this massive multi, multi multi-million dollar company. You can do this stuff at a much smaller scale. Uh, and that's what I've been able to achieve. Um, but other than that, no, I, I hope you guys enjoyed my, my cat popping her head up uh, while we did the uh, interview. She, it's impossible to make her stay out of here. She'll just meow and cry the whole time if I do. So, But otherwise, yeah, Tyler, just thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I, I normally have a, a little Shiba Inu sitting behind me in one of these chairs, so um, uh, I can relate. And I'm sure many of our audience uh, listeners and, and viewers can relate as well as we all still, uh, you know, adapt to a more remote environment than what we maybe were used to in the past. So, Ron, thanks for, for joining me on today's show. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again sometime soon. For sure. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we will see you next time we do one of these fun publisher profiles. And you can learn more about um, some of the other uh, shows and events that we have uh, at www.ezoic.com or you can sub- subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, it's pretty easy to find. It's under Ezoic and we will set up a separate playlist just for episodes like this if you're interested in, in this type of content. So we want to thank you for joining us and we will see you soon.